All right, I've got no updates this week from the Angle Homeschool Academy. The kids went completely feral, and it's just me and the dog and the cats and the chickens. It's pretty much Delta Tau Chi around here. This is A New Angle, and I'm your host, Justin Angle, marketing professor at the University of Montana College of Business. This podcast is my chance to speak with cool people doing awesome things in and around the great state of Montana. We are proudly underwritten by First Security Bank and Blackfoot. Hey, folks, welcome back, and thanks for tuning in this week. The n- latest edition of the COVID Collab, I think this is number seven. The days seem to bleed together. The weeks seem to bleed together. But we are excited to be joined by Missoula Mayor John Engen. Mr. Mayor, thanks for uh, joining us today. Oh, thank you for having me on a lovely May 1st in Missoula, Montana. It is May Day in all its splendor. The rivers are sort of near peak flow, and the sun is out. It's... um. Yeah, it's sort of one of those days that reminds us all why we why we love living here. So, Mr. Mayor, why don't you just give us a state of play? Um, what are we looking at in Missoula right now? What are your sort of key um, priorities, action items? How are you, you know, what's on your docket for management right now? Gosh, you know, so we've been in, uh, we've been in uh, uh, sort of constant planning uh, mode um, for the last six weeks or so, um, and that is that's really uh, that's plan, review, and execute uh, every day. Um, we've had a group of uh, community leaders uh, on the phone started twice a day, um, and we've been able to scale that back to uh, to uh, three times a week. Um, systems are moving, uh, I think, effectively and efficiently. Uh, we're still dealing with the occasional uh, outlier issue or va- variable that was unexpected. But, uh, you know, as of today, um, there are no active cases of COVID-19 in Missoula, Montana. Um, and uh, the old line that you, you don't get credit for things that never happened, I think, is um, likely to be at play for all of us. Uh, I think we've been I think we've been thoughtful and cautious. The community has been remarkable about leaning into this, uh, taking it seriously. Uh, And so while the the economic devastation is certainly real, um, we're we're not adding a lot of insult to injury in terms of uh, human toll from disease. Um, We've we've really kind of met our goals around ensuring that we keep uh, our healthcare system intact um, and ready. You know, this is not over. We operate on limited data. Um, we were largely at uh, the mercy of human behavior, um, but so far so good. And what have been kind of your your key priorities in terms of sort of managing the public health side, managing different members of the community in need, but also thinking about the economic vibrance of the community as well? Well, I mean, it, it's, it starts with that health imperative and ensure, ensuring that, uh, that th- this didn't get much worse in our community as a function of uh, community spread. So those early, those early closures, even in advance of, uh, of state closures, uh, based on governor's directive, I think were critical. Um, we, had, uh, we had small business um, folks being really uh, engaged and active in ensuring public safety by, um, in many cases, closing themselves early. Uh, and so that health imperative and understanding um, ways to flatten the curve, then, then providing the support that uh, our healthcare institutions needed was critical to start with. Um, uh, and then we, we immediately began conversations about, well, if, if you're out of work, um, how are you going to pay the rent? Uh, we, again, this is really about uh, preventing harm as much as possible. Uh, so began applying resources even in advance of the CARES Act uh, to give money out to individuals so that they weren't uh, in an economic box. Um, and then... Uh, and then really expanding from, from there. And, you know, our, our partnership with the economic, Missoula Economic Partnership, um, those relationships uh, uh, and, the, and the many folks, private, public sector, uh, not-for-profit, all coming together 
to really plan around the, again, the, the many uh, sort of gaps in the system that have been identified as a function of this crisis uh, and, and trying to f- figure out ways to fill those gaps locally. Um, and, and all of these parks continue to move. My, my public health uh, mantra today is I want, I want more testing, more testing, more testing because that data provides us uh, real information upon which to base decisions. Um, and so we're hearing at the state level that, that, um, that 60,000 tests a month will be available. Um, and we're trying to figure out today um, how we're gonna deploy those on the ground in Missoula. So that public health piece continues. And then um, this week has been a, largely a concentration around uh, reopening, what reopening looks like, providing resources for businesses to know how they can do that um, in a way that's safe and sound. Um, and uh, we've had, again, ranging from the task force to the good work and resources of both our friends at University of Montana Economic Partnership um, and the Environmental Health Section at the City County Health Department really providing that that guidance and there has need, there, there's tremendous need. We've been hearing relentlessly from folks who want help and guidance and we've been able to provide that. Uh, and then sort of looking down the road, uh, you know, Bryce is, Bryce is, as it turns out, an economist and, um, and uh, I am not. Uh, but, you know, one of the things that resonated from a recent talk he gave to some community leaders uh, with regard to reopening and recovery was this notion of consumer confidence. And that is, um, we, we may all be able to do a great job of uh, maintaining safe environments, but unless the end user believes that that environment is safe, uh, he or she um, may be unlikely to participate. So uh, one of the things we're doing is working on messaging around what is safe and sound uh, and trying to instill some of that confidence. Um, so many moving parts, and I'm on the phone all day long. Yeah, I, I can only imagine the intensity of all that planning. You mentioned there testing. I'd love to, to press on testing a little bit. You, know, you mentioned the governor saying at the state level of 60,000 tests available. What's been the dynamic? I mean, you, there's got to be some pounding on the table for more testing. You say you want more testing. Um, who are we asking for for the who are asking to get the testing from how is it being delivered and, and are you satisfied with that uh, state of affairs uh you know i'm 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 not satisfied um but i'm also uh hesitant to place blame beyond sort of our federal preparedness here um the the really the states and local jurisdictions, and I think I'll emphasize local jurisdictions um, around the country have been the leaders in this and trying to sort it and source uh, the equipment we need, whether it's, you know, uh, two months ago, I couldn't have told you what PPE stood for, but I certainly understand now. Um, and that was sort of our first hurdle is, well, where do we get this PPE uh, we're hearing stuff from the feds that just doesn't end up uh, materializing on the ground. Uh, then we understand state gets a supply of PPE um, that gets that gets doled out, but it was probably a week before between the time we heard about PPE uh, and by the time it, it got on the ground here. Um, and the same holds true for for tests. And so we've been scrambling locally. Um, for a while, we were uh, we were cobbling together uh, testing kits from uh, local providers who could spare them, so that we could tip up a testing facility at the Missoula County Fairgrounds. Um, and I was on a conference call today with the largest uh, leaders of the largest seven cities, um, and we're uh, expecting to have a call with uh, Governor's office next week with regard to testing. Um, I think we need a statewide strategy, and I think we need to have some predictability around the distribution of those tests. I think it makes total sense to deliver them on a pro rata basis. Uh, 
kind of a per capita formula. Um, but the more tests we have, the better off we'll be. And it's been damn hard to get tests. Or if you have the test, you have one piece of equipment that goes missing, something as stupid as a nasal swab. Um, we have struggled to get enough nasal swabs to be able to, to uh, test folks. Um, so that stuff is frustrating. And again, it's not it's, it's not a function of um, pointing fingers. It's really a function of uh, how are we going to how are we going to make ourselves collectively more resilient moving forward um, in in many regards. And you know, I talk about silver linings, and there are there are many associated with this crisis. We've learned a ton about our operations, gaps in service. Um, we've also learned about what I call our ability to accelerate in crisis. Uh, we've made institutional and process changes in a matter of weeks that we would have wrung our hands for years to execute under any other circumstances. And I want us to, to try to maintain some of those instincts and some of that sense of urgency moving forward so that the next crisis um, is a little softer than this one. Indeed. Bryce, uh, you got your hand up with a question. A uh, couple of questions, actually. So if I'm Roughly doing the math in my head correctly, 60,000 tests a month allocated on a per capita basis gets us to about 200 per day in Missoula. That seems awfully small to be able to detect an outbreak uh, until it's too late. Yeah, you know, uh, yeah I don't disagree, uh, Bryce. So what, you know, our back and napkin number was 6,000 tests a month available in Missoula. We uh, and we've come nowhere near to close to testing that many humans, so it, it would be a big step forward. Um, but again, it it's it it doesn't cover the it doesn't cover the spectrum of folks I think need to be tested. So, given that you're going to need a bunch of them for people going into the hospital for elective surgeries now and the like. Is there an allocation to just either randomly test or to test strategically, uh, or have you got that far yet? Well, so so today our protocol is uh, is we are we are only testing folks who present with the latest set of symptoms that CDC uh, guidance suggests are indicative of potential COVID nineteen uh, infection. And that guidance really changed early this week. They added uh, they added a uh, two or three uh, new symptoms. Um, I think I, I, so. So, a I'd like to test everyone who is symptomatic. I believe that there are barriers to that that we need to remove. Uh, the drive-in facilities are great, but our drive-in facility is still by appointment only, and that's a function of the number of tests that are available today. Uh, and frankly, there are folks who are, are, are just not going to pick up the phone, call a number, uh, and, and set an appointment and then drive to the fairgrounds. Um, we, we need to, we need to make it nearly self-serve and as barrier free as possible to test the most people. And that's challenging today by virtue of the number of tests that are available by virtue of the guidance from the centers for disease control and prevention. Um, and, and our, uh, our reticence to, uh, it, given the fact that we have a limited number of tests available, uh, to, to use them on folks who aren't symptomatic. But uh, my, my hope is that that 6,000 a month, um, starts moving us in a direction where we have some real data. So in the absence of tests, at least until you get to a really large number of tests, it seems to me that we're going to need to rely on other public health measures to keep a hot spot from developing here. And a couple of surveys came out in the lat yeah, today and yesterday, which actually have Montana data in them. And Montana is basically at the bottom in terms of the share of people who say they're wearing face masks and engaged in a whole variety of other kind of public health guidelines. Do you guys have a strategy for trying to get that share up? Yeah, so I, so I think a couple of factors are at play, and it's, and it's not unlike the, the history of Montana uh, writ large and um, 
and uh, a continuing sort of exacerbation of the rural and urban divide. Um, I think that if you, again, anecdotally, if you look around Missoula today, um, the, the person in uh, Costco, for example, um, or a target without a face mask is most likely an outlier. Uh, the, our community, again, anecdotally, I think, uh, adopted these uh, public safety recommendations. And frankly, they've, they've largely been nothing other than recommendations, right? Um, we haven't had social distancing police. We haven't, uh, we haven't had anyone cruising neighborhoods to make sure that you're sheltering in place. All of, all of these, um, all of these uh, directions or directives um, have, have largely uh, been made manifest voluntarily. Uh, and I see a lot of that. Um, and, and, you know, frankly, I think there are probably some places where, um, where, where it, it reasonably feels like overkill, but certainly not in an urban center like Missoula um, or other places where there are, there are enough people uh, together that this thing could light up again in a minute and spread. So I think we're in this for long haul with regard to social distancing, the use of masks, et cetera. And remember this mask guidance is also relatively new. Um, and, uh, and it takes a while for some, some norming around that. Uh, but I think folks are gonna get there. I will tell you that my biggest fear is that we, that we relax and uh, this, thing, this thing heats up all over again. Uh, and it's, once around has been incredibly challenging for the world, the nation, our economy, individuals, and a second round, boy, that's a, that's a tough blow. Yeah. And some of the long tail dynamics make it probably even tougher to manage. I mean, we can't, you know, it's not a discreet reopening. And in fact, that's a good transition to talking about the, um, the Missoula reopening working group. Um, in fact, Grant, I want to turn to you. Uh, an obvious cost to not uh, being a part of the COVID collab was that we named this thing improperly. It should be the Missoula Dimmer Switch Committee or something like that. If you listen to Bryce calling for calling it a Dimmer Switch, we would have got the name right. This uh, this uh, reopening is a misnomer. But set that aside. What's going on with this uh, reopening task force? Yeah, thank you. I think um, it's always good advice to listen to Bryce before you take action. I will heed that. But, um, you know, as I was invited to participate in some of these daily calls that the mayor had talked about, um, and I was listening to Bryce's feedback for us about how uh, behavior was indicating that people were not refusing to go and do business with companies because the governor told them to or a county commissioner told them to, that, but because they were afraid of getting sick. Um, I was watching a conversation with community leaders where there was an incredible amount of dialogue between business leaders, institutional leaders, and the public sector, and just incredible cooperation. And I was understanding from Bryce that there was this real tension around uh, the psychology of feeling safe. And it seemed to me, and it was a pretty easy sell to everybody in the group, that if we could expand the conversation a little bit so that more people understood how much collaboration and um, collective thinking was going on between the health department, our big institutions and our business community, and more ideas could be exchanged. We could really quickly build confidence between those business owners who didn't feel yet that they had the guidance they needed, um, the employees who weren't sure if the guidance they were following was sufficient, and the consumers who we really um, want to ensure are and feel as safe as possible. Um, all of those entities would have a greater sense of the um, of the uniformity and com shared commitment that I was seeing at, in those conversations if we had a committee like this sort of working outside of these smaller conversations with more stakeholders from the community. And so that was really the genesis of this is a chance to have that dialogue between um, those practitioners who are trying to implement plans, the health department who is making sure that they created the safe plans, and other community members, whether they were employees um, or consumers, to just make sure that everybody was on the page and understood how much was going into creating a reopening environment that really did match more of a dimmer switch than just a, uh, a, a firing gun for a reopening. Sure. So how do these 
you know, you sort of know you need to pull together a group to to guide decision making on this and, and so forth. You know, as as a leader of some of these sorts of initiatives, Grant, how do you how do you make choices about who who gets on the committee and you know the voices you want to make sure are heard in the process? For me, it's really a function of just saying if Susan Hay Patrick is on it, everything's going to be okay. Right. Um, <laughs> that's usually no. a good rule of thumb. Um, I mean, yeah, I think that, yeah, that's that's a rule that everyone should live by. <laughs> I think we, you know, I, I guess I try to apply some pretty fundamental design principles. I try to apply to everything that I'm organizing, which is what are you trying to accomplish? And then how do you build a team of people that have the skills and abilities to accomplish those things? And in this case, you know, there's a there's this incredible tension right now that all of us face. And I know the mayor is facing on a daily basis between um, it's a, an adage that I love is if you want to go fast, go alone. And if you want to go far, go together. Mm. And we're in this incredible crisis where we both have to go fast and we have to go far. So I think one of the hardest things to do in any of these task forces or work groups is get the right balance of being small enough to be agile and quick and, um, and big enough to be inclusive and expansive. And so um, you're always mindful of how do you put the right people at the table who, are, who trust each other, who have the trust of leaders, and who have the trust of the broader community, and who can bring something meaningful to the table to reflect a, a, their network or their industry, um, and to do that as efficiently as possible. And I think between the mayor and the commissioners and other community leaders, there was, there was, it was pretty easy to start out with a, at least a small group as the seed to start this committee and, and ensure that they had the resources and the capacity to deliver some results. Well, let's talk maybe about some specifics of decision-making here. I mean, we just heard from Rob Watson that Missoula County schools are going to stay closed or in remote instruction uh, through the rest of this, this, the spring academic year. Um, so that's not necessarily a departure, but it is, you know, a little different than, than the governor's purview. You know, the governor gave localities jurisdiction to make choices, um, it seems like Missoula is the sort of place that you know is more dense, um, yet it's got fewer cases than other dense areas in Montana. Uh, what are some of the key metrics or inflection points that you all are looking for um, in deciding how to turn that dimmer switch? I guess we'll start with uh, the mayor, if you don't mind chiming in on that. Yeah, and you know, I, I really like the dimmer switch notion. Um, the lights went off pretty quickly, but I think you're absolutely correct, Bryce, that we need to, we're, we're turning them back on slowly. Um, the, the, so we try to start with, we, we try to start with science, um, what we know about epidemiology, um, what the professional professionals in those fields are telling us about, um, really what little we know about um, this novel virus um, and the way other viruses have behaved historically um, and apply that to just about every situation we have and every uh, critical decision. <clears throat> um, so, the, so the science is always sort of underlining uh, all of what we're doing, but there's a community value piece that comes into play as well. And I think having this, having this team that we put together really, I mean, it, it came together over the course of a weekend um, with, uh, you know, leaders from, from, uh, from local government, from school district, from University of Montana, uh, from the health department, um, uh, and uh, uh, emergency management, having, having all of us on a call twice a day communicating um, values and really bouncing notions and decisions that um, in some cases are, are really outside of our lanes. Uh, you know, in the city of Missoula, I don't run the school district. Um, that's not the case in every municipality in the United States, but it is here. Uh, but the but the willingness of the superintendent to to have conversations with us about uh, the community values associated with um, how to operate schools in this time of crisis has been pretty remarkable. Um, and the same goes goes for us in terms of municipal operations, policing, fire, uh, all all of these decisions. Um, that that under normal circumstances would tend to happen. Um, within 
uh, what, I, what I will call a broad vacuum, but a vacuum nonetheless. Um, they're, they're happening in, in a lot of sunlight. And so these decisions are happening um, really collaboratively. Uh, so there's, a, there's science, there's instinct, and there's experience, and there is, uh, and there is uh, I think, professional uh, judgment. And, um, and having these big brains with the exceptional mind in a room making these decisions uh, means that we're all singing generally from the same sheet of music, um, that our decisions are better than they would be if we made them as individuals, and uh, there's more credibility uh, associated with those decisions. Excellent. Well, let's bring Susan into the conversation. Susan, you are, and I, I guess since we're, everything is is remote and on Zoom right now, it's not really a, an actual press conference, but you're straight back from a, a virtual press conference, uh, standing straight in straight back from downstairs and <laughs> <laughs> from one room of your house to the other. Um, yeah. Governor's task force that we talked about last week, you are sitting in on that committee in, in conjunction with many yes. others, including, including Charlie Beaton, who we heard from last week. Um, the committee issued its preliminary report and recommendations. Can you give us the, uh, give us the highlights, lowlights? Uh, what, yeah. What's the state of affairs in that, in that <laughs> yeah, zone? There was, we just had a call with the governor where Larry Simpkins, the CEO of the Washington Corporations and chair of the Coronavirus Relief Fund Advisory Council, uh, released the committee's recommendations. I think you know that I'm sitting in for Liz Moore, executive director of the Montana Nonprofit Association, whose mom died of COVID last week. So mm -hmm. it really brought home to all of us that you know, we weren't just making abstract recommendations and this wasn't just something affecting others. It was, you know, right here in our midst. Um, I would say the report is uh, more general than specific and our charge was not to recommend dollar amounts, but to recommend um, general categories of funding and to provide guidance. We leave a lot of questions unanswered but um, we focused on several different buckets. And I, I think I should start by saying the one bucket that we did not focus on was uh, state, local, and tribal government expenditures. Mm -hmm. We felt like in the very short timetable that uh, we would focus our time and effort on economic assistance. And that uh, has three components, the immediate safety net, business stabilization, and then tourism, hospitality, and entertainment jumpstart. And obviously the immediate safety net recommendations focus a lot on support for individual food banks and uh, support for individual of uh, food security of families and individuals through food banks and food pantries. So recommending um, uh, strong support of those entities. And also, and this is something that we've talked about as a community is how can we facilitate food from local producers mm. to food banks? Uh, also enhance support for immediate social safety net services. So shelters, uh, behavioral health and substance abuse providers, um, direct care workers, child care workers, urban Indian health centers, uh, domestic violence organizations, first responders, all the panoply of organizations that are responding and then rental and mortgage assistance to business individuals and nonprofits. So that was my specific, you know, area of expertise was that, you know, the immediate um, first responder and, and safety net services. But also I, I am really happy that nonprofits are included alongside businesses in the business stabilization funding recommendation. Um, a lot of uh, priority to be given to providing direct support for Montana businesses, um, some of whom are gonna suffer the effects of COVID-19 for a long time to come. And then right up there to support for nonprofits, not just the ones who are on the front lines of our state response, but um, organizations like the one Grant used to run, for example, Five Valleys Land Trust, which is 
are going to be able to hold its annual banquet, which is a tremendously successful fundraiser. But how can we help shore up the nonprofits that represent uh, more than 11% of our workforce and pay over 1.2 billion in wages annually? A New Angle is brought to you by First Security Bank and Blackfoot, two cool companies doing awesome things all over Montana. Hi, this is Sheila Stearns, Commissioner Emerita of the Montana University System and former president of the University of Montana. You are listening to one of my favorite podcasts, A New Angle. And then forgivable loans or zero interest loans. Uh, and then in tourism and hospitality, uh, just how do we provide a jump start to organizations, um, our entertainment, tourism, hospitality businesses through grants and loans, both short term and long term. So those were the um, that that long monologue is my summary. <laughs> yeah, and I noticed that that you know, and you mentioned this, Susan, that you know some of the some of the social safety net uh, providers featured prominently in the report along with nonprofits. And a lot of that was through direct grant assistance was the phrase used in the report. Um, so, you know, trying to create efficient and direct um, allocation of funds to those entities. Uh, my sense is that there was, there was a, an encouragement of as little red tape as possible um, yes. and efficiency. Um, Bryce, I'm sure you have some thoughts on the report and the recommendations when you had a look and, and, and got your head around it. What do you think? Um, yeah, I mean, obviously, as Susan pointed out, there's it's a broad brush thing, not super specific. And, you know, the devil is going to be in the details because we have a giant gaping hole in the economy. And while $1.25 billion is a lot for a state the size of Montana, it is not sufficient to fill the hole, yeah, uh, even once you account for all the other stuff that's in the CARES Act and other things that have been passed. And so what we're really dealing with, again, is this issue of scarcity. And so, you know, there's going to be more need than there's going to be dollars. And so you're going to have this tension between a need to try and allocate those dollars where you get the biggest bang for the buck in terms of ideally promoting long-term health. Um, but there's also, that's at, you know, designing the perfect efficient allocation mechanism is at odds with the speed that is likely necessary. And, you know, trying to navigate that, you know, the broad brush picture that, you know, you're hitting the right kind of buckets, right? I mean, just to illustrate with a little data, right? On the, on the food security issue, right? So uh, there's a survey called the COVID impact survey came out yesterday. And Montana was fortunately one of the states that they actually did a sample in Montana. Um, and so we now know that, you know, between 15 to 20% of Montanans are suffering from food insecurity and 5% are already accessing food pantries. Um, so, you know, that's between, you know, 150 to 200 plus thousand Montanans are suffering from food insecurity. And we're already seeing, you know, 50,000 Montanans accessing food pantries each week. Um, and that's just, you know, this one survey, there's an error band around that. But so, you know, it's very clear where we need to put the money or where we have need for money. Uh, the challenge is, is, you know, we, how do you make the trade-offs between, you know, really getting the biggest bang for those dollars in terms of, you know, getting people over this crisis here, but also positioning us so that as we hopefully come out of this sooner rather than later, um, we can get out of the blocks quickly. Indeed. Grant, from your perspective, you know, leading the economic partnership here in Missoula, what are your, what are your thoughts on, on the report and the structure of the recommendations? I, I would certainly echo everything that we heard from Susan and Bryce. I, I mean, I think the things that are encouraging to me, um, in addition to sort of the buckets and the, and the broad strokes, was that what the clear guidance offered was some focus around being fast, simple, and really focused on gaps in existing safety net programs. And I think what we have learned through the PPP program on our side and the business side is that um, there have been real gaps in where the existing relief packages have touched our business community. And I think a recognition that those gaps are an important place to focus is a, is a great recognition. And I, I 
hope and trust and look forward to working closely with the governor's team in any capacity to sort of really get into the weeds and try to target where those gaps are. But um, talking about Bryce's concern about a, a a fight in, uh, over scarce resources. Um, our biggest fear is in organizations who, whose mission is to expand and, and create more inclusive prosperity is that we make sure that is, as we face the challenge of COVID, we're not exacerbating the haves and have nots right now. And so a big issue will be taking a close look at where the business has been left out of the existing programs and how can we give them access quickly to these. Um, and I think that's, you know, to sort of talk about the challenges and one other cause of that work group that was focused on the reopening is that we now have the incredible um, and exciting and wonderful opportunity to start thinking about reopening, but we're still helping many businesses figure out how to even start getting the relief that they needed from closing. And so we're now sort of working on these parallel tracks of tremendous and enormous challenge. And that is is really, I think, stretching thin our economic development support community, the infrastructure that exists to support the business community. And so um, in addition to the direct business support, I'm really pleased that there's some notification in here and some recognition that the, the entities that are supporting this work are also going to need some capacity assistance because that's going to be really helpful as we try to expand the ways that we support business growth through these programs. Yeah, absolutely. I think about, you know, four or five weeks ago when Congress was d deliberating over the CARES Act, you know, we were saying you can't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. You got you to gotta move fast. There's going to be mistakes. And we also said, I remember Bryce specifically saying, hey, we're going to hear horror stories. And yeah, we're hearing some of those horror stories about PPP, you know, um, whether it's abuse of the program or inefficiencies of the program or money going to entities that, you know, shouldn't really be getting it, um, et cetera. That's part of the deal. Um, I guess, Mr. Mayor, I have a question for you. I mean, how do you kind of view in terms of a crisis like this when you're when you're trying to craft and enact policy that provides relief and assistance quickly, but does so to maximum efficiency. Uh, how do you balance those 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 two poles, if you will, in uh, in bringing policy to life? Well, it's, I, I mean that that balancing act is the is the crux of every headache I've ever had. Um, the 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 desire to move quickly means that somebody's view of how you move, um, so, somebody gets their ox board and, uh, and it, I mean, it really become, it really becomes this, uh, this, this uh, question of, uh, unless you can show me a viable alternative to the decision I'm making, I'm gonna have to make this decision. Mm. Um, and, and correct as we go. Uh, this is a this is a situation that's demanded that we take uh, uh, calculated, thoughtful risk, um, and and we have to be willing to admit when we're wrong and retool along the way. I mean, uh, you know, this is uh, uh, this is we're 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 all learning something as we go here, and. Uh, and again, we're, we're back to that place where um, if we have a number of uh, smart people in a room with uh, the right instincts, which I think this, you know, this task force was a, a, certainly a thoughtful group of folks, again, with the right instincts and a, and a decent cross-section of, uh, of our collective community um, making those recommendations. And then you, you rely on that and make some decisions and and see how it works. And so another piece of, you know, another sort of idea that stood out in the front matter of that report is the concept of leverage. And, you know, we certainly sort of have a conception of leverage in the financial space. But in terms of, you know, I guess, Susan, we'll start with you. And I'd love to hear about this, you know, from Grant and, and, and from the mayor. When you're looking at, in your organizations, investing your scarce resources in a way that, you know, they can be leveraged to maximum effect. What does that concept mean? And then maybe can you give me an example of, of how you would y use resources to create leverage? Well, this is like stump the panelists. Um, That's right. Hard questions on this Friday. <laughs> um, it's finals week. I, I, 
I guess I would say that our strong, my strong relationship, my organization's strong relationship with the public sector enables us uh, both to leverage our resources. For example, um, with the, our COVID-19 fund, um, we, we, you know, are able to quickly and nimbly um, make decisions that have helped hundreds of people in our service and gig economy. And this fund came at, at, uh, directly as a result of conversations with county commissioners saying, hey, we have such a strong service and gig economy and those people are out of work and they're not making their tips and they're you know, getting laid off and, and how can we help them? Um, I think another example, the report concentrates heavily on uh, support for food banks and some food pantries, some of which in rural areas have, have seen 100 and 200% increases in demand. And we already know that one in five Missoula County residents relies on our food bank every month. But uh, I am going to be having side conversations with our public officials about expanding access to the SNAP program, which really is our frontline defense. And, you know, if you are getting adequate, adequate resources through SNAP, you don't have to go. You can buy your own groceries and don't necessarily have to go to um, a food pantry. But we don't have enough funding for those sort of public sector programs. I don't know if that answers your question. No, I think so. That's all I get. Yeah. And Grant, you had a thought on this. So for me, uh, you know, I think of leverage as how do I get more out of the same amount of effort when I'm trying to do something and being sort of a scientist in, in a geek in my background, I think about my load, my fulcrum and the lever itself. And I, and I see that as the load being what is my goal as an institution or an organization. In our case, it's to get um, our economy going again. And what do I see as the you know, a fulcrum in this case, I usually see that as who are the potential partners to help get that goal lifted further off the ground. And I think of the sort of lever arm as the resources needed to do it. And so um, I think a great example that where I saw tremendous potential from MEP's point of view to, to leverage our efforts and our resources in a way I never had imagined last week was a conversation that I heard between Donna Gockler at the city of Missoula and Rob Watson with Missoula public schools talking about, you know, I was talking about the fact that we're really worried about our, not only do we need to have customer confidence to return to work, we need to have parents to be able to leave their house. Mm -hmm. And I have absolutely all the belief in the world that our uh, school board made the right decision for maintaining the closure of schools and maintaining remote working. But we still have the issue of a lot of us, myself included, having a kiddo in the house and making it harder for many people who have to go to a physical place for work to do that. So, they started talking about some of the, you know, for, from my perspective, it's thinking, how on the earth am I going to think about a, a system that gives kids greater access to safe, healthy, um, nurturing care during the day so that workers in our community can get back to the job? And they started talking about the way that the school district has funds from the CARES Act that they could use to create innovative programs to help kids in need over the summers. And Donna Gockler and her team have a bunch of creative ideas of ways that they could partner up with the schools to deploy that across our town. And so for me, it's a really easy sell to say, I can put one staff person with a tiny bit of effort into a conversation with those two to think about how to leverage that partnership and relationship and those resources into an opportunity for many more parents in this community to have the confidence they can take their kids somewhere and drop them off over the summer and get back to work. And, and, and do good for kids, do good for our schools and enrichment, and do good for economic development at once. And for me, it's seeing opportunities like that that are, that are really symbolic of truly leveraging resources and partnerships to make something better and bigger than it would be possible to do on my own if I were trying to tackle this problem. Indeed. Uh, Bryce, additional thoughts on that? I just want to put a little numbers to Grant's parent concern. So sure. I did a little data analysis last week. And so one in four Montana workers uh, are part of a household with at least one child under the age of 13, where all of the adults in the household work. So basically 25% of our workforce uh, needs childcare to be able to go to work. And 
So yeah, you have a real problem if you can't solve that problem. And so it's very good to hear that uh, you know people are working on solving that problem. Indeed. Well, I want to shift gears as we're kind of coming up against time to an issue that Susan raised attention to. It's 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 not directly related to COVID nineteen, but it certainly does have grave implications for how our community um, gets represented and can derive resources and can advocate for itself. And that is the census. Um, participation in the census ha has been um, below desired pace. Part of that is attributable to the lack of in-person outreach, which is an important channel for generating census response. Um, Susan, you raised this topic in our pre-conversation. What are your thoughts about the census? Why is it important? Why should people um, complete it and get involved and, and encourage everybody they know to do the same? Because so much is at stake for our state in terms of federal funding that comes into Montana, uh, in terms of uh, the fact that we could gain an additional representative in Congress, uh, that it affects everything, healthcare, education, public assistance, any virtually every public program you can think of. Um, uh, districting, it, it, it's just a tremendously influential process. And we are, uh, the legislature has allocated just $100,000 to the census, which is what they advocated or allocated in 2010. That's roughly nine cents a person. Um, and we are, we are considerably behind where we were at this point 10 years ago. And uh, as you mentioned, 20% of our citizens haven't even been assigned an ID so that they can complete the census because we rely so heavily on um, in-person contact in a rural state. And the census also won't mail to PO boxes. Right. So um, people have to get out and knock on doors and all that can has come to a halt and is unlikely to resume until June. And Mr. Mayor, you can and forgive my ignorance on the issue. You know, is there are there things a city can do to encourage our participation in the census and, and, and market it in, in a way? You know, we're we're trying to do that sort of collectively, um, but frankly, that's taken a, a backseat sure. to everything else that we're doing. Uh, you know, capacity is an issue here. Uh, you know, Susan has been. You know, she, she's involved in all things good and and has been working pretty diligently with uh, Missoula County, which had some capacity to to try to drive home the census message. But again, that it's it's really fallen by the wayside as a function of all of this, um, and it has lost none of its importance. And in fact, has likely uh, gained importance, ironically. Yeah, well, tough not to crack. Public service announcement, get out there, get involved in the census, encourage everybody you know to to, um, to participate. And uh, yeah, let's not lose sight of some of those fundamental things that we have to move forward. Bryce, additional thought? Oh, just, you know, you can do the census online. You don't yeah. have to do anything. Just go online. Right, it takes and, just seconds. Uh, then all you have to really do is enter like the name of everybody in your household and when they were born and you know, what your ancestry is. It's really simple. Yeah, go and back Bruce a few weeks. used it as a, a social studies class for homeschooling his kids, which I thought was absolutely brilliant and that everybody should do. Absolutely. Yeah, go back and uh, listen to that story. And in fact, that's our that's sort of a good cue to transition to our, our weekly closing thoughts where each one of us share something we're uh, hopeful about, excited about, happy about. Um, Let's start with uh, Mr. Mayor. What do you think? What do you? Uh, what gives you joy right now? Uh, seeing the number of human beings who are exhibiting their best nature at the moment. Um, the the evidence is all around me every day with regard to community generosity. So, for example, today. Uh, Missoula gives an annual effort of the Community Foundation to help fund nonprofits who are doing great work. Um, they're blowing past their uh, they're blowing past their goal, um, uh, and and they're doing it on a brand new platform that they cobbled together in really short order. 
Um, and, and that's evident over and over again, people working together um, as neighbors and families, uh, as well as, uh, as leaders and, uh, and movers and shakers. Um, lots of folks pulling in the same direction. And, and uh, I sound a little Pollyanna, but um, we're, we're doing okay, all things considered. Awesome. Grant, how about you? Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start on a downward trajectory here, but it'll come up at the end, so bear with me. And, and that was just that I've talked to a couple businesses this week, and we certainly saw the headline today that the Northside Kettle House is closing permanently. Um, I know for a fact we're going to see businesses we have loved in this community for a long time shut down forever as a result of COVID. Um, but we are now at zero active cases in Missoula, people have sacrificed and we have all made these incredible efforts to be safe here. And I think it's really promising to me that we're in a position that we can reopen. I think we have all the right people in all the right places doing what we can to make it as safe as possible. And I'm I'm really excited about a chance to go um, do business in some of my local retailers and restaurants next week and to slowly and steadily and safely follow all of the guidance, but start to rebuild that really powerful sense of community that I know we get when we come out of our houses and into our public spaces and, and businesses. So I'm really, um, I am under no illusion how well this has to go to be what we want it to be, but I'm really excited. We've already come to a place where we have a chance to try to take this next step. Awesome. Thank you, Grant. And Susan, you made the request early on to never follow Bryce. So you are next. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for respecting my wishes. <laughs> uh, I want to, uh, two things. One, I'm on the statewide task force for the Montana Nonprofit Association. And I said this, John, earlier today when John and I were on the Missoula Gives live stream that no other county even approaches Missoula and how it's addressing COVID-19 terms of the immediate crisis and um, in terms of, of how we're looking ahead to recovery, just unprecedented. And the other thing to steal from the mayor, I'm looking right now at the Missoula Gives website. Oh, they've just surpassed during this conversation $600,000 raised. Um, their goal was something like $450,000. So they're almost to $601,000, 2,600 donors, 137 organizations. It's just amazing and very gratifying. Excellent. Bryce, what do you got? Uh, so I got two things. So first, obviously, I love data, and I like to play around with data. And one of the, I guess, one of the upsides of a shock this big and this fast is the data collection community stood up and has put a, an enormous amount of effort into collecting data. And so now we're getting all of these surveys uh, that we're going to be getting every week or every other week um, that are going to track this crisis in real time. Now, we didn't get this in the Great Recession, right? We just kind of use the standard data sources for the most part. And so our ability to understand what's going on, uh, how many people are affected, how much they're affected is going to be much more enhanced in this crisis. And I hope that will help us create a better response. Uh, and then on a, just a more personal note, uh, I took half a day off this week and went up to the Sealy Swan and had a great time with my family outside uh, in the beautiful uh, state that we live in. And it was quite rejuvenating. Uh, so I'm still feeling the high from it two days later. Awesome. Good for you for getting out there. Uh, I guess I'll close with, you know, so, so uh, you know, this was our last week of class uh, for the semester. And, and what a strange semester it was for our students in so many ways. And I finish each class with this, like, sticky Justin's rules of business. And the last rule um, is kind of a paraphrase of this graduation address that David Foster Wallace gave at Kenyon College in 2005. And he recounts this parable of two fish. There's two young fish swimming along. And this old fish approaches them, swims by, and says, hey, boys, how's the water? And a couple of minutes later, one of the two fish, the two younger fish turns to the other one and says, what the hell is water? And there's a larger, you know, speech and message associated with that. And, you know, it occurred to me um, th how much that sort of, one, sometimes how difficult it is to adhere to that wisdom. 
and um, just my own efforts to try to do it myself with my own family this week. I had a difficult start to the week with family and reminded myself of that wisdom and that perspective when I was preparing for class to to encourage students to, to take that perspective themselves. And it really helped me turn the week around. Um, had a great uh, close of the week with family, friends, and my wife and children and all the people around me that... Um, yeah, it was just a just a, a matter of perspective that um, made me really happy, and I appreciate uh, those of you in the audience who've dealt with me not happy. You can attest to that to some degree. Anyway, I will stop rambling about personal stuff. I want to thank the panel. I want to thank uh, Mr. Mr. Mayor John Engen for joining us for freeing up some time. Apparently, you have a call with Grant Keir in two minutes, so I don't want either of you to be late for that. So, uh, yeah, until we meet again, folks. Thanks. Have a good Thank week. you, Justin. Thanks so much, Justin. Take care. Thanks for listening to A New Angle. We really appreciate it. And we're coming to you from Studio 49, a gift from University of Montana alums Michelle and Lauren Hansen. And remember that A New Angle is supported by CED, Consolidated Electrical Distributors. These guys pretty much sell anything electrical you would ever need, but they also hire a ton of our students. If you want to learn more about jobs at CED, visit cedcareers.com. Before we go, I want to thank some important peeps, our awesome interns, Aspen Runkle and Max Gibson, Jeff Amet, John Wicks, and VTO for the tunes, and finally, props to Jeff Meese, our master of all things sound. Finally, if you have any questions, suggestions, comments, insults, whatever, please email me at anewangle at umontana.edu. Help us spread the word, and be sure to use the hashtag anewangle when you do. Thanks a lot and see you next time.